Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 56 Heat of the Moment War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. It's almost impossible to know what our kids are talking about when incessantly tapping on their phones without blatantly invading their privacy. It would shock us to know that some of our teens are engaged in toxic relationships, wrought with psychological manipulation, emotional abuse, and the threat or existence of physical violence. We've seen it here before, with Marin Sanchez and Jolie Musa, girls who were caught in the webs of obsession. This week on Murderous Miners, we're in Hope Mills, a suburb of Fayetteville, North Carolina, and not far from Fort Bragg. This case was covered extensively by Jane Velez Mitchell on HLN, Dateline NBC in an episode with Dennis called The Creek, online on True Crime Daily, and on Hometown Homicide on the ID channel, each offering unique insight. All links are in the show notes and soon to be on MurderousMiners.com, which I'm hoping to have ready shortly. After leaving the area at age 5 and spending 10 years in South Carolina, 15-year-old Danielle Danny Locklear went to live with extended family in Hope Mills. Her mother was dealing with a divorce in Myrtle Beach and Danny went to live at her grandparents and aunt's home to focus the best she could on school and just being a kid. Danny had spent the summer of 2013 staying with her grandmother and step-grandpa at their farm. She worked at a church camp in nearby Autryville, about a half hour away near the Cumberland County line. When it came time for Danny to begin her freshman year at Southview High School, she was excited to go to school with her new friends. Her extended family welcomed the opportunity to spend even more time baking and gardening with the bubbly girl they loved. Known for her green thumb, Danny Locklear was equally known for being a hard worker at her grandparents' property selling watermelons in the summer, never afraid to get her hands in the dirt. In addition to those new friends, Danny had met a boy that summer when she was still 14. The day she met him had made such an impression on her that it was commemorated on Facebook as the best day of her life. The boy was 17-year-old Jamichael Malloy who lived in Autryville, a boy whose family had long ties to Danny's. His mother would later mention in an interview that the two families are somehow related, though I couldn't confirm if or how. He was Danny's first serious boyfriend. The families grew closer and attended the same church who ran the summer camp where the teens met. Danny's family described Jamichael as introverted and quiet around them. What they saw was a polite boy with the makings of a proper young man. There was one instance at the summer camp where the teen got noticeably upset at a much younger boy, maybe six or seven years old, and the story goes that he pulled a knife on him and church staff members had to separate them. But still, they just chalked his behavior up to a blowing off steam kind of thing. He was a senior at Cape Fear High School where he was in the ROTC, ran track and played on the varsity soccer team. Jamichael had aspirations of being a sniper and planned to join the Marine Corps following his graduation in June 2014. As the teens dated throughout the summer and fall of 2013, social media posts show how the relationship was playing out. Photos and posts depict a tale of growing love. The pair were always together, at church, school dances, and even a wedding. 
August 8, 2013 saw her post on Jamichael's Facebook wall saying, quote, Truth is, you're the best boyfriend ever and any girl should be so lucky to have someone so thoughtful, sweet, and strong. I'm so lucky you're mine. But Danny wasn't the only teen close to her boyfriend. Jamichael had a best friend, Dominic Tavon Locke, also an 18-year-old senior at Cape Fear High School, with whom he shared his ROTC life and Marine Corps dream. By December 2013, online posts seemed to hint that maybe Jamichael was having a difficult time splitting himself between these two important people in his life. Near Christmas, Danny changed her relationship status on Facebook to complicated and posted, quote, I feel no love because some people are too busy with other friends to pay attention to their girlfriend. Christmas is supposed to be a happy time. I feel like poo. Like many couples of all ages, the pair had an on-again, off-again relationship. When they weren't doing well, family recalled that Danny would become quiet and subdued. But by Valentine's Day of 2014, the young lovers seemed back on track with Danny posting a screenshot online of a sweet text her Valentine had sent her that morning. Danielle had begun spending time at nearby Rockfish Creek, set back in the woods just walking distance from her grandmother's home. The creek had become a secret hangout for high schoolers, and most of the adults who lived in the subdivision just in front of it didn't realize that it was even back there. Unbeknownst to her family, Danny ditched school on Tuesday, March 11, 2014, and spent the day at Rockfish Creek with a handful of other kids. With her aunt and grandmother in Atlanta for a doctor's appointment, Danny was left in the care of her step-grandfather. Around 9.45 p.m., her grandpa said that she had asked if she could return a book to her friend's house down the street. Distracted by his video game and not fully realizing it was getting late, he said she could go. After an hour or so, he realized that Danny had not returned and got on the phone to try and contact her. He received no answer and headed to the friend's home, half hoping, half assuming that the teen had simply lost track of time. Upon arrival, he learned that not only had Danny not stopped by, her friend didn't even know to expect her, and they'd been texting all evening. Somewhat inexplicably, Danny's grandpa waits until the following day to phone police, who pretty quickly determine that this case could be serious. As her aunt, mother, and grandparents try to track her down through friends, they realize a few things, the first being that Danny's presence on social media had dwindled dramatically in the preceding weeks, and that there had been no activity since she went missing. When police were notified, they at first assumed that Danny left her home voluntarily and felt that after 24 hours had passed, there would be more cause for concern. Family began calling Danny's friends again, desperate for any verification that she was alive and safe, but no new information had come up. Her aunt remembered that the day before Danny ditched school to go to the creek, she had encountered her breathless niece in the driveway when she pulled in from work. Danielle had explained to her aunt that some friends from school had shown her the creek and that they wanted her to ditch school and hang out with them there. She promised her aunt that she wouldn't. By Thursday, March 13, two days following Danny's mysterious disappearance, her mother and aunt were on the banks of Rockfish Creek, knowing Danny had been there on Tuesday for sure. What they found there could only be described as ominous. A shirt they knew was Danny's, a towel her aunt knew came from their home, and a sock. A fluffy, black, white, and gray striped slipper sock Danny's aunt knew belonged to her niece because she had bought them for her. A search party of over 300 descended on the area but found no further evidence. It was mostly just debris and personal belongings left behind by kids rushing to get back to school and catch the bus home. School seemed to be going well for Danny. She was in the ROTC at her school, too, and did well academically. Friends recalled her infectious laugh and memorable personality. She fit in easily and well with any clique in the lunchroom, so to find out that Danny had been ditching was a surprise. Family wondered what else they didn't know about the girl they were frantically searching for. 
And they search and they search. Canines are brought in and the FBI joined the investigation. Police moved on and focused closely on Danny's step-grandfather. They seized electronics from the home and had questions for the last person believed to have seen Daniel Locklear. He explained to them how he had been distracted by his video game and waited so long to call police because he thought he needed to wait 24 hours. He was scrutinized heavily for this, even though as soon as police were notified, they themselves said that once 24 hours had passed since Danny had last been seen, they would focus more to be sure she just wasn't at a friend's house. But after further questioning and a successful polygraph examination, Danny's step-grandfather was cleared and family members never once suspected he was involved. Police hadn't found any evidence on the phones or computers they had searched that indicated he was. Knowing Danny had a pretty serious boyfriend, Jermichael Malloy needed to be spoken to and he voluntarily showed up at the station to offer what he knew. He told police the pair had recently broken up because he'd be graduating soon and joining the Marine Corps. Danny was only a 15-year-old freshman. So you broke up with her? Right. Okay. In face-to-face or went on the phone? Over the phone. Okay. And you called her and you broke up with her? Yes. How did you feel about Danielle? I mean, at first, you know, it was love. Amazing. And then eventually... Like, just love at first sight kind of a thing? And uh, eventually, you know, spark dies down and we just grew apart. I mean, I still love her. I mean, she was a good girl. Yeah. Sounds like everything I tell her sounds like she's a great person. No. He'd been side-by-side side with Danny's family members since she'd gone missing and regularly asked if there were any new developments in this case. He appeared to be extremely concerned. Now there he was, seemingly ready to tell police everything he knew. His alibi seemed solid. He was home with his family and his best friend Dominic studying for their college entrance exam the following day. Like at seven something, he called me. He wanted me to come over because we had ACT testing the next day. Yes. He wanted me to come over because we had ACT testing the next day. And I asked my dad if I can go. He said, yeah. Four people corroborated Jermichael's whereabouts on the night in question and police moved on. On March 18th, her cell phone had been discovered to have pinged off Interstate 95. They felt she could have been on the move. Eventually, her phone was traced to a massive yet secluded campground off Claude Lee Road near Fayetteville Airport. They didn't have any idea how it got there. In the meantime, tips in the hundreds continued to pour in, and each was followed up on. Hope was beginning to be lost that Danny would come home alive. Murderous Miners is brought to you by Audible, the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. What is Audible? It's the gift of free time. Listen while cleaning, walking, running, driving, shopping. Honestly, I even listen in my sleep. It takes multitasking to a whole new level and makes it enjoyable and even educational. It's the gift of excitement, as every month, members get one credit to pick any title, plus two Audible originals from a monthly selection and access to daily news digests from the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, as well as guided meditation programs. There's podcasts and theatrical performances and A-list comedy, too, and the day my credit drops is one of my favorite days of the month. Audible even makes me a better parent. I just listened along with my daughter's high school English class as they enjoyed The Great Gatsby, narrated by Jake Gyllenhaal. It gave us the opportunity to appreciate great literature together, an experience we just fell into because of Audible. The Outpost by Jake Tapper and Dr. Sleep by Stephen King are my day and night titles for now. Both books are massive, so being able to download and listen across devices without interruption just streamlines the experience even more. The Audible app is free to download, and you can keep your credits for up to a year. If you've yet to try Audible for yourself, check out audible.com slash warbaby to get started with a free trial. That's audible.com slash warbaby, and get ready to put your headphones on. Murderous Miners is brought to you by Away. They started with the perfect suitcase, crafted with features that make travel more seamless. Now they offer a range of essentials that solve real travel problems, so all you have to think about is where you're headed next. Everyone likes to